I have a side project which is called um, Cliques, which is a friend of, with a friend of mine called Hamish. And a lot of it is really drummy. There's a lot of drums in there. As in this track, for example, has drums and bass and um, and that's kind of it. It's got a synth in there, but it's not really important. So I thought it'd be a good thing to open. Um, this is something that's just been, or just about to be released on a 12 inch on um, Aquatic Lab, which is kind of a dream come true because they were one of my favorite record labels. Um, this is the, I won't play the whole thing. Tell me when it gets too painful. So it just kind of goes like that, and then it goes like this, hi-hat, more stuff. And then there's this sort of breakdown in the middle, and then it goes back to our main section. Um, so I thought I'd just talk about, I mean, it's, and it's a super simple track. The idea with this track was just to kind of, it's got a kind of like throwback sort of feel to it. So we didn't want to do anything too particularly um, fancy with the sounds. Um, so you'll see that it's it's all just the samples which we've chosen, which are kind of meticulously um, looked for and sampled. Um, and then, you know, like a, a few reverbs and um, a bit of compression and a lot of saturation. Um, like I said, the idea is to get this kind of older style. I, I do really didn't want it to sound like a computer. So we've got a lot of sort of, sort of um, uh, saturation emulation and those sorts of things going on here. Um, but yeah, um, let's first look at the um, the drums. Um, in this case, I've because it's such a kick and bass heavy track. Um, it was. It seemed like a good idea to um, group the kicks and the bass together. So um, just so you get this nice sort of relationship, and I've put a glue on them to kind of move them together, so that when you have the um, the, the kick hitting, I'm not using sidechain compression, but when the kick hits, it sort of pushes the bass out of the way, um, essentially. Um, so I'll just... So these are the kicks. I've got myself a, um, an 808 as the low kick. Um, just really simple, nice pitched long kick. Um, I think that this is the full sample. And then just taking out sustain. I don't really like sustain in kicks. I usually just like to use the decay parameter um, in order to do the enveloping on it. And I've taken out a bit of the, um, it's barely even noticeable, but a little bit of the, a little bit of the pitch at the start. Oh. Yeah, I've just taken out that. Um, uh, but yeah, these, this is what I pretty much use. I sometimes use simplers inside drum racks, but in this case, um, I've just used simplers. Um, simplers are absolutely amazing. You can do absolutely uh, not anything with them, but you can do a lot with them. And if you can't do something in them, you can do it in the sampler by going like that. Um, but this one is really simple. I've just got this um, 808 and I've compressed it um, with these settings, um, letting a little bit of the attack through, but mostly just sustaining the sound. It's not super obvious. Yeah, just just sustaining it a bit more. I take out the low end of the kick sometimes, just below 85 hertz, because um, the bass kind of fits in there. And then I also love this plugin. This is kind of my, um, does anyone use this one? Yeah, no, yeah, you should, it's good. Um, it's called um, Decapitator and it's by a, a, a group called Sound Toys um, out of America and um, they do things like Echo Boy, um, this one Decapitator and essentially this one is just like a, um, it's a really good saturator. You've got all different types of saturation and, and this one in this case, I've just driven it up a bit um, and then just pulled the tone down so it just gives it a little bit more um, emphasis on the low end, so. I mean, this isn't great monitoring environment, but just gives it a little bit more grit and definition from the the sub bass. Um, and then on top of that, I've layered um, this kick drum, which is sampled. I'm happy to admit that. Um, and I've again compressed it. 
So it's, it was originally quite kind of pokey and st stabby, um, but with a little bit of compression, um, you just kind of even out that initial transient and just kind of make it a little bit more sustained and long. Um, and it just kind of fits a bit better. Um, I didn't need to take out any of the low end because as you can hear, there's a lot of high end in there anyway. I mean, I, I rolled off a tiny bit, but yeah. Um, and then, so the whole track is kind of based around this, this AB between these, um, these two bases. So you get like the call and response, I guess. You get the tension and then the, the release in the low end, um, if you were thinking musical terms. Um, and all that is is just another um, 808. I love 808s. They're, I mean, you can see this one is like a just like a sine wave, clearly. Um, and then so how I've, how I've built that, I'll play it on the low one. Um, you can hear it's not just a normal 808. There is some sort of modulation on there. And that's just modulation on the... Um, uh, on the on the volume, so um, so each simpler has an LFO which you can adjust down here, and this one's set to eights. But you know you can. Um, so like really, really, really simple. Um, but yeah, just LFOing on there, no filter or anything, because uh, well, filters don't really make sense for me when you're talking about 808s because there's the fundamental frequency and that's it. Um, unless they're a bit more distorted, but in this case it's pretty signy. Um, and then just a bit of compression and, and for some reason I use a different saturator. This is a, a, just a different one, just kind of, just gives it a bit more, a bit more of this. Yeah, um, what else? Then there's these kicks here. There's this sort of thing. So this is what gives it some of the kind of groove, it makes it a bit kind of weird, this, this strange times um, weird kick thing and, and these things, which, that cool and then just the addition of um, these shakers which come in here So the shakers, shakers are really low level, um, but just put some some more saturation on them so it cuts through, and um, and put this this delay on it just makes it give it a bit of width to it, um, and kind of gives it a different rhythm. Um, I also uh, I really love old kind of spring reverbs and convolution reverbs and all that kind of stuff, but I can't afford them. Um, so some of the times I used the Max for Live um, convolution reverb, it's got some nice springs in there. Um, but a lot of the time I just take the actual spring sound from the Max for Live convolution. So does everyone know how the convolution works? Uh, essentially it's you, you play a sound into a room and then you, um, you record that sound and then you put it into a convolution reverb and it tries to replicate the qualities of that sound or that um, effects unit um, and so you have the ping but then you can also just use the ping um, as a sound and I think I, that's what I did, I did in this case like this was one of the so you get this sort of feeling that it's this clap because I've laid it at the same time as as this clap here when I play both of them at once it's it's sort of like I'm playing the clap through in a convolution reverb, but it's a lot easier and doesn't require processing. And it's a bit brighter as well. Um, yeah. Um, got my snare processing. Um, taking the low ends out, you'll notice I've taken the low ends out of everything. Um, just taking off some of the highs just to take some of that harshness out of it. And then um, using this nice um, reverb as an insert. Um, what else? Oh yeah, I mean you'll see these a lot. I, I love this plugin. Um, uh, I think of them like magical plugins. These L3s. They're like they give you extra gain. Well, they give you extra perceived loudness, but there's, there's no gain increase, um, which is amazing. Um, uh, so yeah, just you can. I mean you can. I mean, 
So this just kind of takes out a little bit of the kind of the spikiness from the start of the um, snare and, and gives you more consistency in the dynamic. Um, what else? Yeah, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of kind of incidental sounds down here. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, th 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 yeah, that's kind of that's kind of it. I mean, like, there's a few other like noise sounds and everything like that. Oh, I guess I could show you. I, I've, I use a lot of um, return processing, so um, just I, I love returns because they kind of give a room to your sound. So if you put a lot of drum sounds into a single reverb, they'll sound like they're coming from the same room, obviously. Um, and then I try and emulate, you know, older reverbs by just taking out the highs and the lows. It gives it sort of more of a um, warm kind of tone to it, which is more reminiscent of older, um, older reverbs. So just, just kind of giving things a little bit of ambience, really long reverb here. Um, this is a this is a delay I use on everything. Um, I have a delay that's really really short, and it's set to, I mean, 19 milliseconds, which is below the persistence of hearing things as individual events. So, and it's the most important thing here is it's set to ping pong mode. So ping pong mode means that it's um, playing alternatively on the left and right speaker. So it adds this width to all these higher sounds. So I run all of the high sounds through, a, you know, give a little bit of the, the, the shakers and the claps um, into, into this H delay. And it just gives this beautiful kind of width to it. And it doesn't fuck with the original sound, which I love. And they've also got, it's got a lot of feedback on it, you can see. But yeah, if I take that ping pong off, listen to the stereo spread. I mean, this isn't optimal conditions, but you can hear the difference. You're getting less repeats, but they're alternating uh, because they're alternating on each speaker. Um, yeah, which is width 101. Um, another re reverb, another reverb, yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's the track. And then maybe I'll just show you, because I don't have that much to talk about, I'll just show you the difference between mastering because I, 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 I teach at live school and I always get questions about mastering and people getting their tracks mastered and what they should send it at and then you know what they should expect to get back and what's the difference between vinyl masters and digital masters and all those sorts of things. Um, so this release um, like I said was on Aquatic Lab and um, the reason I like their records so much is because the masters are amazing and everything's so heavy and um, so what they do, which is the case with a lot of record labels, is they'll do a, a digital master and then they'll also do a vinyl master. And the digital master is usually pushed a little bit more than the vinyl master um, because the vinyl master, you know, I guess you don't have to compete with other tracks. It's not like you have vinyl on your iPod and then you, you know, you skip forward, I guess. And it's also to do with the process of mastering. I think if you push things too loud, they fall off the groove or something. I don't know. Um, but... This was the pre-master which I sent. So it's it's a relatively hot pre-master. Um, but I think the main thing with um, with sending off pre-masters is just that you're not clipping. I mean, sometimes uh, mastering engineers ask you for a lot of, um, you know, lots of headroom. Um, but I think the main thing is that you're just not clipping and, you know, that your peaks are at least 2 dB below zero. Um, and I think I'm kind of averaging at about probably four, six dB below. So that's what I sent the masking engineer. And then this one here, um, I sat in on a, so these are the three different masters. Um, can anyone guess what this one is? It's a vinyl master. Um, this is a vinyl master that was, um, this is done at dub plates and mastering in, in Berlin. I got to sit in on this one, kind of probably one of the best mastering joints in the world, in my opinion. Um, and you can see the difference and you can hear the difference as well. So you can see that it's not even coming close to um, zero. It's kind of probably coming up to minus two. Um, and it also has a completely different sound. So. And then this one below. This one below will be the, um, the digital master. I'll just A and B them. So 
you can hear there's just there's a lot less pressure in the vinyl master um and because as i said so the um the digital master was actually done in bristol um by uh, optimum mastering um which is where all the kind of livity sound stuff gets processed um and they like their stuff really pushed and this one was just jammed up it's just been limited to the maximum and and the high ends really cut through which is really nice which i really like but um yeah two completely different products from one original source um so that's why it can be kind of uh, important to be at somewhat prescriptive when you get things mastered or say you know give give mastering engineers um reference tracks because there is so much movement i mean people think of mastering as just loudness maximizing it's not there's so much going on there and you can get something that's completely different out of your source product um which you may or may not like and it's always louder so you always go yeah it's louder but i mean i guess you need to think of that the frequency distribution whether your tracks have that um same dynamic in terms of volume in them whether the intensity is still there in the uh you know whether there's still that volume suspense in the breakdown etc 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 cool i think that's i think that's it for me